The second Corinthians is chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Now while you turn that, let me say in regards to this hockey, <laughs> there's another verse that says, We cannot help but speak those things which we have seen and heard. <laughs> You know, my wife used to tell me, she used to say, what are you going to be when you grow up? And that's when I was about 55, I guess. And I said, I want to be a hockey goalie. And all my life, I want to be a hockey goalie. If I had to have been come and reincarnate and come back in some of the life, I'd run back as a hockey goalie. And I didn't put on ice skates till I was 60 years old. And up in Lansing, Michigan, by the Green Church, I went out there in the ice. They said, you want to play hockey? Come on and play. I said, man, I don't know if I can stand up on skates. And I got out there at six years old, went out there in that rink, outdoor rink, and I thought for a minute I wasn't going to be able to stand. And I said to the guy, how do you move in these things? And he showed me, and I got moving. And I got moving real good. Then I had a problem in stopping. <laughs> <laughs> and I fell down four or five times. I played goalie, and I played two hours that night, and two hours the next night. I found out one that you played game outdoors in 20 degrees, you sweat like a horse, man. You can't even you can't even wear a sweater. 20 degrees, man, you just sweat clean through. I came back the next year and played again, and this year I played forward. And I'll tell you what, next time I'm up here, why don't some of you landmarkers here rent you that wrinkle? Don't you got a wrinkle over here a little ways over here? Rent that ring we'll play a little hockey, okay? Oh, you don't believe it. I forgot you folks are Christians. <laughs> But I'll tell you, man, boy, I've seen the lightning crash and heard the thunder roll, boy. <laughs> man, the first year after pay those guys, I went home that Monday night and got home that night and sat down in my living room, my wife and kids, you know, and, and sit around there at home, you know, and I'm, I love my wife and kids. I enjoy being home. Glad got me home safe. And I sat there in that living room, and, you know, three, three women, you know, and wife and two girls, you know, and, Remember sitting in the living room, I went down across that rug toward that fireplace, and that thing just turned blue, boy, and I could see that ice and those blue lights, and hear those old sticks going, clack, 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 boy, those bodies going, bam, boom, boom, bam. <laughs> I phoned up Green in the telephone, and I said, if you guys are playing hockey up there, I'm going to come up and shoot you. <laughs> and they were, they were. Well, if I come up here again sometime, you'll get your ink over there, and we'll, we'll have a little fun, get so. Uh, Give me, give me some good guys to play with. I'm giving you some guys to handle the fellas under 40. I'll handle the ones over 40, okay? Okay, 2 Corinthians. You folks lose your sense of humor. 2 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. You said, I've never heard a preacher talk like that before in my life. You just sat down. We've got about an hour to go here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourself. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith or not. Prove yourself. Know ye not how that Christ either is in you, except ye be reprobate? If you are a reprobate, you won't know that Christ is in you, because he's not in you. But if you're not a reprobate, you'll know Christ is in you if you examine yourself. Uh, Paul, throughout his lifetime, had Christians who evidently had trouble in realizing the indwelling Christ. Evidently, a lot of the Christians that Paul dealt with never did get it straight that their body was the temple of the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ was in them. You know that from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, what? No, you're not your body the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So they had trouble with that. And those folks there in, uh, over there in 1 Corinthians, they had all these talk about the gifts of the Spirit and healing, you know, and... They went around quoting, Greater is he that is in you, that he in the world, and all this and that. And yet at the same time, they really didn't know Christ was in them. And he said uh, in this passage, Know ye not that Christ either is in you, except you be reprobate? In that case, you wouldn't know. But if you're not a reprobate, if you're a saved person, then you know Jesus Christ in you. And the admonition here is for you to examine yourself and prove yourself and see that so. Now, I don't believe a Christian can lose salvation. I believe in the eternal security of the believer. I would always believe in that, always will. I never doubted my salvation seriously, more than about two or three seconds, every five or six years, something like that. Doesn't bother me much. The devil comes around to me and says, you're lost. I say, okay, get off my back. I'm enjoying myself. 
That's the way to handle that thing. You see, some of you when the devil gets to talk to you about your salvation to say you're not saved, you couldn't be saved and do this, you couldn't be saved and say that, you used to do this and now you don't do it anymore, and, and how could you be saved and do or think what you, you know what you do? You get arguing with the devil about your works. And the first thing you know, you get doubt in your salvation again. Don't ever argue with the devil about your works. Look at here. I've done all that I can do to get saved. But no use me getting talking to the devil about what else I need to do to get to heaven, because there's nothing I can do to get to heaven. Amen. I have put my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if that doesn't work, then I'm just good in hell with the door shut and the key thrown away, and I'm not going to sweat it out. I'm just going to enjoy the trip home. <laughs> Folks, I never heard such a thing. I'll try it out and see if it works. The trouble is you, the devil pins you down and gets you looking at your feelings and your works. That's where not to look. But he says, examine yourself, prove yourself whether you be in the faith. That is, it doesn't hurt you to check up once in a while and just see where you stand. Uh, God's people are prone to backsliding, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And God's people, uh, once in a while, will say, put it this way, they need to have kind of a little uh, a checkup. Checkup. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. said to me one time years ago, he wrote me a letter, and he used to write me quite frequently. And we had, a, we had a real good relationship. I always thought very highly of him. I haven't changed my mind any either through the years. And Bob Jones C. wrote me a letter one time and said, Pete, said, now, he said, uh, I trust your judgment, and I trust you know what you're doing. He said, but a fellow came by my office the other day and came and talked to me for a while, said he was a friend of yours. And he said, uh, I guess he was a friend of yours. He said, but I never met a more eccentric character in all my life. And he said, now, Pete, he said, I trust your spirit of judgment. You probably know what you're doing. But he said, you know, sometimes the just doesn't hurt us kind of, you know, once in a while just kind of check up on ourselves. And he had that fellow's number. That fellow got in the biggest mess you ever saw in life that got me in it and along with it. And I've been going along there. I just hadn't been uh, checking some things. It doesn't hurt you to examine yourself. Uh, back when I uh, was a younger man, why, they had a war, and they had a real war, had the big one. And we won it, too. We beat the two biggest, strongest countries in the world, Japan and Germany. I don't believe we could whip a country the size of New Hampshire right now in the mess we're in. But you think back in those days, they gave physical exams. And the famous physical exam was inhale, exhale, you sail. <laughs> that was the one. That was the one. Inhale, exhale, you sail. A guy would come back, a guy would come back from the place where he had his exam, you know, his physical checkup, and they'd say, did you pass? No, I'm 4F. They said, well, I didn't know anything wrong with you. He said, yeah, I got a physical defect. And they'd say, what? And he'd say, no guts. <laughs> he'd get that. <laughs> like the guy, the guy didn't get married to a woman. He said, why didn't you get married? He said, they have religious differences. He said, she believed in money and I didn't have any. <laughs> well, anyway, you're supposed to get a checkup once in a while. And once in a while, it doesn't hurt you checking some things. Now, I'm going to write down some uh, things tonight, and they're little things. I mean, there are things that uh, you just wouldn't uh, you, you just wouldn't check up on them. You kind of take these things for granted as a child of God. And uh, as a child of God, every now and then you need to kind of check up the things I'm talking about here. Now, I know you get good preaching here. I know that. And I know you get good teaching. I know you get a variety of things. I know anybody that comes to this church regularly, gets a good a diet in a year round. You get anywhere in the world. Uh, Brother Rollins has all kinds of speakers in here, representing every shade, every kind of Christianity, every branch of Christianity, every kind of fundamentalism. And folks, see, they'll, well, they'll criticize him. Sure they will. You are business. You're living in the day and the age of the great uh, sissified Christianity, where a lot of these leaders are, they're just taken up and, do you know who so-and-so had in? You know who so-and-so had in to preach for him? But you know about him, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, man, I've been saved for something like 35 years now, and there's some fundamentalists don't even believe I'm a saved man. That's right, they really don't. You know, say, so why is that? It's my language. They don't think a fellow can be saved and talk where I talk. I, I, I'll confide something with you. I don't believe they could be saved and act like they act. I've been saved 35 years, and it's taken me 35 years to get used to Christians. They are the most thin-skinned people you ever saw in your life. You just say, boo at them, they're ready to leave. Something wrong with them. Something wrong with them. Brother Gray came out of our church one time, preached our graduation about two years ago. 
Truth it is, they kicked him off the board at Bob Jones. Been down in Ruckman's church. Ruckman. Bob Gray had me in the Christian camp down there one time, and there was a son of a preacher there in town. I, I'd say his name, except I will offend some of you, so I'll say it. His name is... <laughs> <laughs> he pastored Smyrna Baptist Church there in town. And his boy, it was a teenage boy, came out of that camp. When he got back to his daddy, he was just, boy, just bubbling over. Boy, daddy had a revival, and boy, I got right, and so and so got right, and boy, the Lord poured out the Spirit, and we had a time. And his daddy said, wonderful, wonderful, been praying for his son for years, kid about 16 years old. He said, who was the speaker? And the kid said, Brother Ruckman. And his daddy's face fell about a foot. And he telephoned up Brother Gray and said, you can't have your girls' quartet come by here and sing anymore, advertise your school, because you had Ruckman in for a meeting. Listen, if you, if you wouldn't have enough guts to have a fellow like me in for a meeting, you're not worth shooting. <laughs> Very ideal, you know. Brother Rollins had Bob Harrington in to speak. Brother Rollins must be an apostate. <laughs> Did you ever hear that? Yeah, I've heard it. You know what that stuff is? That's a bunch of sorry people who have nothing to do but just mess around and talk about each other. A bunch of gospy old women. You know, having who in, you know, who speak. Listen, listen. If I got an invitation to speak in St. Peter's in Rome, I'd be there and I'd preach. Amen. Now, of course, I wouldn't get invited back, <laughs> but I'd, I'd go, I'd go, I'd go. I mean, I, I'd go where the door open, brother. Go with it or open. Now, once in a while, you need to check in some things. I'm going to talk about these things. And uh, the first thing is this. When, when you got into a place of need, did you pray? When you got in a place where you had a real need, did you pray? Did you pray first, second, or third? I mean, you're tearing down the road, and a hurry place gets someplace, and you're late, and you had a flat tire. What was the first thing you did? <laughs> do you know about many Christians to do the first thing you ought to do? It's kind of like a certain Christian said. He said, I was in this jam and that jam and didn't have this and was caught over here without this and had no way out, so I did the first thing any Christian would do. And the guy said, what was that, pray? He said, no, I used Bank America <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, it's amazing how, how much God people will do, much God people will do, before they do the first thing that they ought to do. And the first thing they ought to do is pray. When, when you had a need, when you had a need, did you, did you, did you go to the Lord in prayer about it? Did you take it to God in prayer? Did you pray for grace in the time of need, when the time of need came up? Years go back in the days of those Salem vessels, an old boy named Billy Hicks, and he'd been saved when he was a little boy, but got far from God, like a fellow will in the Navy or the Army. And one night, one of those old sailing vessels, back there about 1800, 1900, the terrible storm of trying to get some sails uh, taken in. ship was heading the wrong way and couldn't get them unfurled. And two men had gone up the yard arm and died. One of them hit the deck, other fell in the drink, couldn't get him out. And the captain ordered Billy Hicks to go up. That was nighttime, wind howling. And Billy Hicks went up, and he asked the captain for a couple of minutes before he went up, and the captain gave him to him, then he went up in the rigging and got the sails fixed up and came back down, everything's all right. Next day, a storm was over, and they passed another ship going the way and had the semaphore thing they signal with, daytime flags, uh, n nighttime, have this uh, light thing rigged up, you have this shuttle and turn this light off and on and send out a signal. And they came alongside a sister ship the next day, the sister ship pulled up alongside there about oh, a couple of miles off and signaled to them. And the captain on board the other ship signaled across there and signaled, uh, what was that message you were trying to get through last night? And the captain of the first ship said, signaled back, I wasn't sending any messages last night. And the captain of the other ship said, well, we caught a message that came off the cloud layers and decoded it, and here's the message. You know what the message said? And he repeated it over back to him. It said, Dear God, <laughs> I was picking this up at night, guys. Somebody's got a light flashing this thing off the clouds. Dear God, this is Billy Hicks. I'm about to go up in the yard arm, and I'm probably not coming down except I hit the deck. 
And Lord, you know I'm not afraid of anything. And I'm not afraid of David Jones' locker. But Lord, if I hit that deck, let me go with the guts of a clean man and give me the feeling I had when I knelt at my mother's knee in prayer. Billy Hicks. Up he went. Got down safe. Well, that fellow did. He got in a time of need where he needed some help. And the first thing he did was pray. And a prayer with a semaphore up to a cloud bank, just good as anything else. Did you pray when you got in a pinch? Did you pray for grace when you got in a pinch? Did you thank God for disappointment? Now, see, these are little things. These are things you forget. I mean, I know you come to church. And thank God you come to church. I know most of you give, and thank God you give. And most of you, well, maybe not most of you, but some of you witness once in a while. And thank God you do. And you try to treat your family right and pay your bills and, you know, and all that kind of business. But these are just little things that after you've been saved for a while, they begin to slip. And I don't know why they slip, but I know they do, and I know you need to check up on them. Did you thank God for disappointment? I mean, take that case where you're in a hurry to get someplace and the car has a flat tire. Did you get out and thank God before you began to take the lugs off and get the spare out? You know what I find myself doing if I'm not careful? If I'm in a hurry to go to somewhere like that and something goes wrong, you know what I find myself doing? I don't cuss, you know. But I must confess, sometimes those old familiar words come to one's mind. <laughs> Of course they wouldn't with you pious folks, not you, not you, not you. But you take the coming there, and listen, If you, what you need to do, examine yourself, prove yourself. You're a child of God, you should be acting like a child of God. And not just when you're in a church building, you're out there and something goes wrong. And sometimes it's very difficult, very, very difficult in everything to give thanks. I remember years ago, about 1960, I was going through some pretty rough times, at least I thought they were rough. Had me in a panic, you know. And looking back on it, you know, I see now it wasn't quite as bad as it looked. But hindsight's always better than foresight. You look back over it, you know, Monday morning, it always looks different. And going through that thing at that time, I was real upset, real disturbed. I was in a, about in a traumatic state. I picked up a book one time written by a psychiatrist where he gave you so many points for a kid dying and so many points for your wife leaving you and so many points for losing the job and so many points for getting changed in the place where you live. And the idea was if you had 300 of those points together, you were a potential suicide because <laughs> you built up this tension, you see. There was a time there when I had 550 points. <laughs> so I thought I was a pretty good candidate. And yet, you know, when that stuff all piled up, I was up in a church in, uh, in northern Michigan, Holland, Michigan, not northern Michigan, but west Michigan. And I was at a church up there in Holland, Michigan with a friend of mine named Garland Cofield having a preaching service for him. I found out later Roy Batum had got saved in those services before he got that church put up in California. But at the time, I was just licking my own wounds, feeling sorry for myself. And you taking that mess was going on one night, Garland Cofield and I were talking about it in his living room, and he didn't say much. And after a while, he said, well, let me ask you this, Brother Pete. He said, do you thank God for it yet? And I said something else to change the conversation. But what he said stuck. Now, after that thing was over, I went back out of the room and went down the basement of the church, got praying for service, and the thought suddenly struck me, and all this thing I'd been through, I haven't thanked God yet. And I wasn't going to either. I mean, you know, well, how can you thank God for that? <laughs> you thank you, Lord, for nothing. <laughs> Of course, you wouldn't say that, not you, Pastor. <laughs> and after a while, I'd go and gone down there, and you know something? I couldn't thank God for that thing until six months after that. And after that, the thing began to work out, and everything came out fine. Matter of fact, it came out better than before. But that book says, be thankful. Give thanks. And everything, give thanks. Did you remember to do that? If you remembered to read your Bible, did you remember to do that? Do you remember to have the blessing at the table? Did you remember to do that? Did you remember to ask God to give, give God thanks for something when you got a real disappointment? I mean, a sure enough one. You know, when I take a meeting, uh, my wife sets the alarm clock, and I lived by myself for years and years. I'd set my own alarm clock, but I would always wake up before it went off. 
And after a while, I quit setting the alarm clock. If I want to catch a plane at 6 o'clock in the morning, no, I've got to be there at 5.30, and 30 minutes to the airport, I'll set my mind for 5 o'clock. And when I go to bed, I wake up from 1 to 3 minutes before the thing would have gone off. Kind of like you set an alarm in your head someplace, it rings in the morning. It takes all kind of folks to make a world, you know. <laughs> and there was only one time in my life that I was late for a plane getting up in the morning, and that was the morning I trusted a guy to wake me up. Now, the only time. And his name was Nathan Bemis. And he was a fine fellow, loved the Lord, fine and sweet fellow, one of the sweetest souls you ever met in your life. My little boy said, well, Brother Pete, I promise you I'll get you up in time. And I wake up at that time of the morning anyway. We had a big youth fellowship last about 1 o'clock in the morning. I had to get up at 5. And I said, boy, do it or I'm not going to get the plane. Well, don't worry, Brother Pete. I'll, I'll do it. I'll be there. I'll, be there. I'll, I'll, I'll get you up. And I trusted him. Had every, every reason to trust him. He was a very dependable fellow. And boy, I woke up at 7 o'clock. That plane been gone for an hour and a half and no Bemis. <laughs> I got in the car and ran over and got him up and got out the airport and was late and missing that one and got the thing out of there two hours to catch the thing in Atlanta. When I got there, I was on standby in Atlanta because I'd missed my seat. And I was out there in the stand out there in the snow and sleep there and getting a sore throat. When I got off that plane at Henninger's to pe- preach that meeting up in Canton, Ohio, I had a sore throat and just about pneumonia and came in so late I missed the first service. Now, the problem there is... Thank you, Lord. I really do appreciate this. <laughs> Did you know there's no such thing as an accident in God's plan for your life? God will let certain things happen, but boy, it's hard to thank Him for them sometimes, isn't it? I realize I'm talking to people here tonight that have a lot harder things to thank the Lord for than I'd have to thank for. And I, I, I know what I'm saying. It's tough. I got a phone call one time when I was a meeting in Oklahoma, city of Oklahoma, and my wife phoned up, and she's in tears and about to get hysterical, said, I don't know what I'm going to do, and what's the matter, honey, what's wrong? Well, I am blubbering over the phone, and I thought, oh, goodness gracious, some of the kids have been killed or hurt or something, and finally got out, she burned out the block on a brand new Oldsmobile. <laughs> I mean, the piston just stuck in it, boy, 900 bucks. That was back in 1971. That job would cost you, I guess, about 33000 bucks a day. And, <laughs> and 900 bucks, you know. And I said, that's all right, honey, don't worry about it. Well, you're not mad? No, I'm not mad. You're not upset? No, I'm not upset. I mean, uh, while she's worrying about that, you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about one of the girls, you know, with a leg gone or an arm gone or... Come home and have to have a funeral, little old girl, two years old. The worst thing that happened to you than has always happened to most of you. Most of you got it real easy, you know that? Got it real easy. I hope you appreciate it. Examine yourself. Prove yourself, whether you be in the faith or not. Now, what else do you need to do? Well, let me ask you this. I want to check you on this thing here. Did you look? Did you look for a truth in God's Word when you studied it? That when you studied it, did you ask God to show you something from it, or did you just read it? You would examine yourself in those things. Did you pick up the Bible and study it just because it was a Sunday school lesson? Or you pick the Bible, did you read it because that was your daily reading for that day, and in order to read the Bible through once a year, you had to read uh, two chapters in the Old Testament and three chapters in the New Testament, one of them things? Let me ask you, when was the last time you opened that book and said, Speak, Lord, thy servant hear it? When was the last time you opened that book and said, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law? When was the last time for that? I mean, if that book is the Word of God, and I believe that, and God Almighty has given you the other words He wants you to have, and I believe that, if that's, that's a book so great it contains mysteries that angels desire to look into, and the Bible says they do, is it beneath you to search it? Is beneath you to search the scriptures to see if these things be so? God's people don't study that book. They say, Brother Upman, I haven't been called to preach. That got nothing to do with it at all. So they say, Well, I've been called to minister. You don't have to be called to ministry. He said, Brother Upman, I don't have a college education. You don't have to have a college education. The Bible says back there in Isaiah chapter 28, when that book is delivered to a man that is learned, who has the college education, he says, I can't read it because it's sealed. And was given an unlearned man that didn't finish high school, he says, I can't read it because I ain't learned. 
And the Lord says, you're both lying. <clears throat> you're both lying. The thing is, you don't want to read it. You've got a sneaking suspicion what it's going to say. <laughs> like a fellow said down south one time, said, the only reason why you're against that book is because it's against you. And that's true. You saw a brother Ruffin, what person but a mad, mad man would be interested in reading the book that was against them? Well, when you get a new nature, you enjoy a testimony against you. When you get a new nature, you enjoy a testimony against your old nature. Amen? I mean, you folks here that don't appreciate good, hard, straight, rude, crude, plain preaching, there's something wrong with your Christianity. Listen, if you were where you ought to be in the right fellowship of the Lord, you'd appreciate a rebuke. I mean, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, did you do that? Did you search that thing? You said, well, I just had much book learning. I don't think I get it. Listen, we had, a, we had a meeting last year, and down there at school, I've gotten more and more conviction every year about not having not enough, have enough preachers in there. All my people get to hear is me and McGee all the time, and I want to have them hear somebody else, learn how somebody else does it. So the last couple of years, we've been having two revival meetings a year and inviting three preachers in for both of them. Those kids can hear six different preachers every year. They've been there three years, get 18 of them. And one guy we had in is an old redneck mutt in North Alabama named Red Robinson. And Red Robinson is an old Alabama boy, had never finished high school, went off and joined the Army. He talked just like a colored man. You couldn't tell the difference. You take that fellow, he can hardly read and write, and when that fellow gets up, he'll give you something new and fresh every time he hits that pulpit. i never seen anything like it in my life, that guy. I remember the first time I heard him, he got up and said, Well, he said, You folks say you believe the Bible, and I guess you do. You try to go by it, and I suppose you should. So where is the women in this church that teach the young women how to love the husband? Would you stand up? Boy, Titus says the older women teach the younger women to love their husbands. I know, you know what, the next time he got up, he got up and said, Well, <laughs> I mean, crazy thing you ever heard in your life, man. I mean, just you think the guy is almost illiterate. Boy, he'll bomb you out of your seat, man. You know what he's doing? He's studying that book. He's praying for wisdom. He's getting wisdom. You never heard such wisdom. Out of boy got up and he said, well, he said, uh, you folks uh, love Jesus Christ, I guess you do. said, and you try to honor him and give the glory he has coming to him, and I believe in that. Well, the Bible said, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. Well, when you fellows out in the job and working, and somebody takes the name of Jesus in vain, do you bow down and confess him right there? <laughs> That's what it said. It said at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend. Good night, man. I thought threat to having your church. <laughs> you know what he said one time? He got up and he said, This fellow come to this vineyard, and he said he come here three years. He said, seeking figs on this tree. And he said, why does it come to the ground, cut it down? He said, I wonder why we don't apply that. He said, well, I'm have a big sign out in front of a church saying, when you join this church and become a member of this church, we'll give you three years to bear fruit, and if you don't, out you go. <laughs> Wild stuff, man. You are some of the greatest things you ever heard in your life. You get from somebody that just reads that book through because they love it, and God shows them things. You know, there ain't no Greek Hebrew scholarship to it. It's the Holy Spirit that wrote that book, that ex can explain that book. That's the one. I had one this morning, you know. I don't have a TV at home at all. It's the one. I had one this morning, you know. I don't have a TV at home at all, you know. But I get out in a, in a meeting, I'll run across there. I'm looking for a spiritual blessing or else a hockey game, one or the other. <laughs> With me, they both come under the same heading. <laughs> and I've tried my best to find some good spiritual TV programs, you know, and boy, you can't find them. You can't find them. I usually give up a couple of them just turned off. 
I heard one old boy this morning, cut a preacher. Man, he could preach. That bird was going. He's preaching the older brother. Man, I got high, I can't meet right in that room, man. I'd run around the room, jump up down the bed and holler and scream, man. He'd say, is that right? And I'd say, that's right, brother, that's right. <laughs> you know, am I right? You right, you right. Now, he's putting on, boy, I never heard such an exposition the older brother in all my life. He said, and when the prodigal son come home, he said, older brother said to his daddy, he said, uh, daddy, how come uh, you never uh, cooked a piece of roast lamb for me? So well, in the first place, he probably never asked him to. <laughs> well, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> and he said, you know why I didn't ask him to? Because his heart wasn't in the right relationship with his father. And when you're in the right relationship with your father, you always ask somebody else to pray for you. You don't do your own prayer and ask for nothing because you're afraid of what he's going to say to you. <laughs> you're right, brother. You're right, man. You're right. I never heard any better than that, man. He got on there and he said, you never asked any of my friends to come there. Well, uh, the kind of friends he had, you probably couldn't invite to the father's house. Well, that's a thought. That's a thought, man. And he said, now, you can choose your friends, <laughs> but you can't choose your relatives. <laughs> that's it. That's it, boy. That is it, man. See, he was pointing out that fellow was his brother no matter how he felt about him. He's your brother. You don't pick your brothers. Listen, man, now let me break the bad news to you gently. How many of you men are saved? Let me see your hands. I'm your brother. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Because like he said this morning on that, on that TV, he said, you ain't got nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's your father that decide who comes in the house. Amen, 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 amen. Where did he get that from? He didn't get that from any Greek or Hebrew manuscript. He got that from the author of that book. When was the last time? When was the last time that you opened that book and prayed and said, God, show me something? Give me some truth. Open my eyes. I want to ask you about this. When was the last time you showed love for a brother or sister in Christ by not saying something you could have said? You know, I hear the brethren talk about love these days. All they talk about love, love, love. And Ruckman doesn't have enough love, and we still don't have enough love, and we need more love and this and that. I wonder about those people sometimes. I wonder about them. I wonder about some of you are standing out of some of you. You really show this love you talk about? You hear you talk about all the time? You really show it, do you? Let me ask you this. When you could have foreborn saying something that you could have said, did you forbear or did you go ahead and say it? Get mighty quiet in there, preacher. Mighty quiet. I think I can hear that clock run. That Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. You ever cover something up purposely just to give somebody a break? You haven't? You rascal. Don't you sit there and talk to me about love. You whitewash hypocrite. You, you, you go stick your head in a bucket of water three times and pull it out twice. Don't you kid me. Don't you kid me. All this stuff. I've had people come around to me and say, Do you hear about so-and-so and so-and-so -so breaking up? I'll say, yeah. So they, I never thought they'd have broke up. I thought they were going to, not might going to last forever. Well, I said, it's a sad thing. They said, well, it just shocked me. It just shocked me. I just didn't know anything about it. And I said, well, I knew about that a couple of years back. And I've had them open their mouth and say, you did? <laughs> and I'll say, yes. And I'll say, why didn't you tell me about it? Because <laughs> it was none of your business. You get the message? Because <laughs> it's none of your business. One time a lady came to Frederick the Great, and she said to Frederick the Great, I want some help, Your Majesty. And he said, What about? He said, My husband doesn't treat me right. And he said, That's none of my business. And she said, He doesn't talk about you right either. He said, That's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you just cut down and get everything down and get rid of everybody's business but your own, you'll find you've got enough to do to keep you busy. When was the last time you did that? Now, let me ask you this. When's the last time you stuck your neck out? 
for Jesus Christ. When was the last time you took a chance for Jesus Christ? When was the last time you laid your head in the block and took a chance? I mean, some of you folks are too conservative. Some of you folks, you, you witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you, you couldn't find it. Any more you could find a whisper in a hurricane. You're like a man with yellow jaundice in a yellow room with yellow bedspreads and yellow furniture. Nobody can find you when they come in the room. There's a fellow down, fellow down off the beach in Miami they call Holy Joe. And one of our graduates down there working down there with him. And uh, glad he got a chance to work with him. And Holy Joe has spent all his life going up and down the beach as Miami witness. And he goes up and down there fully clothed, all those nude and seven nude people around there, and witness to him. They all make fun of him and laugh at him. A couple of times he's been arrested and then got back out of it. And they call him Holy Joe. Holy Joe, they call him. That old boy there, he's a saint. You say, Brother Ruffman, are you suggesting that I go up down the beach like that in public and make a fool out of myself? No, but I suggest you make a fool out of yourself some way, for Christ's sake. I mean, Paul said, if any man among you seem to be wise, in this world let him become a fool that he might become wise. We're fools for Christ's sake. How about you? You a fool for Christ's sake? Now, tell me about it. When? When? Some of you birds sitting here tonight, 40, 45, 50 years old, you never made a fool out of yourself one time in your life for Jesus Christ. So conservative. I mean, so, so, such respectable folks. Acceptable. Don't tell me, listen, don't tell me before you were 40, you didn't make an ass out of yourself on a number of occasions. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't think there's a grown man this bill over 30 years old that'd make a consummate idiot out of himself at least once or twice. Come on. Twice? <laughs> uh-huh. Once? <laughs> I'll bet if I knew the history, I'd find one time. And the trouble is that the thing here, you'd make a fool out of yourself with the devil and make you a fool out of yourself over a woman or make a fool out of yourself to get a buck, but you wouldn't make a fool out of yourself for Jesus Christ's sake. When are you going to do it? I read a story one time that got on me under deep conviction and was about an unsaved man. Matter of fact, most of the things I've ever read in the Christian ministry preparing messages that have got me under conviction were about unsaved men. They seem to have more character than saved men for some reason. I can't figure the thing out. But you take over in Vienna after World War II was over, the Russians met there with the Americans. They all drank toast to Stalin, cognate, and a bunch of vodka and stuff. And at that meeting over there were all the American communists who'd been communist sympathizers all through the war. One of them was a Jewish fellow, an unsaved Jew named Billy Rose, who was a New York showman, put on the ice capades and everything. You may remember him. And Billy Rose was there, and they drank a toast to Lenin, a toast to Stalin, a toast to Roosevelt, and a toast to Churchill. And finally they noticed Billy Rose wasn't drinking. And one of those Russian officers said, well, how about some cognac for friendship to the interpreter? And Billy Rose, through the interpreter, said to that Russian general officer, with 200 officers and big shots around that table in the palace of Emperor Franz Joseph of Vienna, Billy said, you tell him I used to sell that stuff back in the States and nobody but suckers drink that stuff. <laughs> Listen. That was an unsaved man. Boy, did he stick his neck out. I wonder if some of you would stick your neck out that far for Jesus Christ. That fellow wasn't even saved. Wasn't even saved. Let me ask you another question. When was the last time you had spiritual communion with a brother or sister in Christ? I mean, fellowship built around a spiritual thing. You know what God's people tend to do? They tend to get together and just have fellowship around uh, personalities and around church problems and church politics. Boy, I'll tell you, many a church down south, when a bunch of Christians get together for a prayer meeting in the home, all it is is an effort to get rid of the preacher. That's all it is. You know. Or have a friendly little Bible study. <laughs> I've seen him work around, you know. Let's... let's the deacons get together, let's invite so-and-so in and take care of the music, you know, we kind of ease the pastor out. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how it is up here. I say up here, you're, you're not too far up here if you're right out next to the river. But you take Southerners, they're the greatest politicians on the face of this earth. 
everybody knows everybody. Everybody's kin to everybody. And some of those Christians get together, all they do is just talk politics. They don't talk about the Lord Jesus. They don't talk about the Bible. They don't talk about prophecy. They don't talk about soul winning. They don't talk about Bible doctrine. They talk about, I like him, I like her, and I like them, and I don't like them. Do you like them? Well, I used to like them, but I don't like them. Do you like this? Well, I like that. Well, shut your mouth. <laughs> I mean, start liking what God likes and not liking what God don't like. We got a little boy down there in Pensacola, Florida. They call him the old gospel man. J.G. Whitfield, the old gospel man. Boy, he, he is something else, man. You talk about you talk about a wimp. I'm telling you, that, that guy get on the air every day, you know, for about two hours and advertise for some grocery store. And in that grocery store advertising and saying, well, now, uh, good afternoon, all you fine folks. Well, this is the old gospel man, old J.G. Whitfield, and we hope you folks are fine out there. How you fine folks doing? We hope you're feeling fine. Well, I'm feeling fine. Well, how you fine? Well, all you good folks out there, we sure appreciate all you fine folks. We'll get a fine record here for all you good for. Oh, come on. Nobody's that good. <laughs> Nobody's that fine. All that stuff. I like it. I just don't like it. <clears throat> you're talking about Elvis Presley and John Lennon and Belushi and some of these dope-headed fornicating bums. And those folks down say, well, I like him. <laughs> well, some folks like you know, like a fix. So what does that prove? You're getting too quiet on me again. <laughs> I feel like that color preacher this morning. He said, talk to me, man. Talk to me. <laughs> when was the last time you had real spiritual communion? I mean, you didn't get together to pray, you know, about somebody you didn't like you're trying to get rid of. But got together to pray somebody was in trouble and hurting and needed help. That's the business. I mean, examine yourself, prove yourself, whether you be in the faith or not. Know ye not that Christ dwells in you, except ye be reprobate? Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you gave any encouragement to a new convert? You say, well, I shake the hand, that's fine. Did you visit them in the house after they got saved? Did you go by and see them? Did you might have buy them over for supper? You know, you, you know, some of you saved people have been saved for years and years and years and don't win the souls of Christ and have a hard time witnessing. You know one ministry you could do that you're not doing? You could take every new convert this place has got here and take them out and begin to work with them and help them with the Word of God, encourage them to go to services and bring them to services. You know the trouble some of you is? You, you're hard and right. Well, they knew what I knew about. The preacher, they knew what I knew about the trustees, they knew what I knew about the debt, if they knew what I knew. Listen, you rascal, if God knew everything about you that he knows about you and told it to me, I couldn't stand to look at you. What you better do, you better get rid of that stuff and get into some kind of ministry and help somebody out. Now, new converts need help. I'll be eternally indebted to two fellows in my life. One of them is dead and gone now, the other one is still living. The man that led me to Christ was Hugh Pyle, and Hugh Pyle is a fine fellow. Loves the Lord, bleed the book. He's a, he's a sweet fellow, real gentleman, not like me a bit. And that fellow's a real nice, sweet gentleman. He loves the Lord and bleeds the book, and he's a mild-mannered fellow and a quiet-spoken fellow, and he hangs out with uh, all the crowd that's got no use for me at all, and I'm sure, I'm sure they give him a fit. I give some nice fatherly letters from him once in a while, and I appreciate him. I mean, really, I'm not being sarcastic. He sent me a nice letter saying, uh, Dear Brother Pete, uh, I think if you'd present your beliefs in a little bit more acceptable fashion and not quite be so hard along some lines, you might get a better hearing. And if, if you could just learn how to kind of present, you know, he tries his best. And if too late, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> but I appreciate him. And I know when he goes up down the country, he often preaches to the fellows that probably spend the evening devotion praying that God dropped me in my tracks. But he hadn't yet. <laughs> And you take old Hugh Pyle, he's the guy that got me drawn. Um, you see me up here drawing tonight? You know who got me up here drawing? Hugh Pyle. I wasn't going to draw. I was going to preach like any other preacher. And Hugh Pyle found out I'd been painting some murals there in town for the cocktail lounges, the radio stations. You know what he did? He came by the radio station one day where I was working, had a little old booklet about this big of Sunday school cartoon tracks by E.J. Pace. He used to cartoon for the Sunday School Times. And he said, you're an artist? He said, maybe you'd like to look at those. He knew what he was doing. He got looking through those things, and I thought the first thing that any artist would think, I thought, 
Selain di Barenat <laughs> And first thing you know I got me a board and got out there on the street And I was drawing his cartoons And the first thing you know I was drawing my own And the first thing you know I was quoting scripture when I was drawing them And the next thing you know I was preaching when I was drawing them I didn't learn how to keep them sitting over a mic cord And keep the chalk off all the clothes and on the board with the perspective and composition and color right and memorize the scripture and keep the outline just overnight. But that guy got me going. He helped me. He helped me. I said, oh, that guy that helped me. He did not go. And I was on the Glen Shunk. And Glen Shunk was an old saved Catholic from Indiana. He was saved in World War II and I lost. But Glen Witness, when he was in, led people to Christ. And he went up to Bob Jones, he was up there in the trailer, in the front row of trailers up there at Bob Jones, and I'd just been up there a couple of months, got in bad trouble with administration, and stayed in bad trouble ever since. <laughs> and I had bad trouble with the administration, and made five minutes in the radio station. And I was thinking about quitting school, and coming back down south, and get my man radio someplace else. And I walked by that front trailer, and walked by that front trailer, Glenn Shunk came out and said, uh, do you know Pete Ruckman? And I said, that's right. He said, you're a new convert, aren't you? I said, yep, that's right. I said, I, could you tell? He said, I can tell you by your face. He said, you got a face like a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's me, that's me. And he said, uh, you afraid to preach on the street? That's the right thing to say. It's like sicking me a bulldog, you know. You afraid to preach on the street? No, I'm afraid to preach on the street. He said, why don't you come along next Saturday and preach on the street? I went out there and preached on the street. I led my first two souls to Christ. One was a black fellow walking down the street, about 25 years old. One was a white man, a truck driver, in the cab of a truck, about 30 years old. And I got a taste of that. I got a taste of that and went back to that school and dropped all my radio courses and enrolled in the freshman Bible, even though I had a college education, and came clear through again. I've had three college educations. I had to start clean over and come again for a postgraduate. But Glenn Shunk got me in the ministry. He's a help to me. You get people saved here, some of do you? You keep track of them? You help them out? You go by the house once while during the week with your Bible and help them out with some scriptures? You don't just sit there and blink at me. Listen, some of you folks leaving that stuff up to the preacher and up to the, up to the workers. Some of you folks I'm talking to right now could do that, and you do a better job because you're close to them, they don't even suspect you. <laughs> Amen, 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 amen. Got a boy up there in uh, North Alabama named Troy Hardy came to school one time. You know what he told me? He told me he got saved, and he said he'd been saved in that town for 20 years, and he said for 20 years he was saved in that town up in North Alabama. He said not one preacher, not one Christian came to his house and shook his hand and congratulated him for being saved and told him anything about the Christian life and nothing. Nobody gave that for any encouragement at all in 20 years. That's a terrible thing. You know what that is? That's a bunch of Christians that have gotten careless. Now, I'm, I don't mean too hard on you. You don't mean to be careless. Things just slide, don't they? You get the time payments, the car payments, and the wife's sick, and the kids are in trouble. And you get careless. And you examine yourself and prove yourself whether you be in the faith. One more shot. One more shot. Have you been of any assistance to an unsaved man? You say, well, I'm supposed to come out among them and be separate. Yeah, but Paul said, the only way you get complete separation is leave this world. <laughs> I mean, as long as you're in this world, you have to be with unsaved people that are going to be around. And sometimes we get an idea, such an idea about unsaved people, they're kind of untouchables, and sometimes we get so isolated from them we can't do them any good. You're not going to win unsaved people of Christ by just putting them off like a bunch of lepers in a pen and leaving them alone. You're not going to do it. Some of you, it, 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 it doesn't hurt a Christian to stop and help an unsaved fellow fix a tire in a car. It do not hurt you. It don't hurt an unsaved fellow to go next door to his neighbor and help him tune his motor at his neighbor. It do not hurt you. It don't hurt you. I think about one of our young men was riding over to Jacksonville, Florida one day with Bob Gray. We tried to get Brother Bob a plane out, and he got fogged in, sacked, socked in that morning, and fog wouldn't let him out. And so we had to drive him over there, and one of our young men drove over with him. 
And as they came into Jacksonville, the rough end of town there, they saw some long-haired boys standing out there in the street, cigarettes hanging out of the mouth, a rough-looking bunch, couldn't have a half-man, half-women, you know the kind. And as they went by there, one of our young men, the young men helping, helping Brother Gray drive the car, going to put him off to take the car back, the young man said, Ah, look at those sorry creeps out there, you know, that kind of thing. And Brother Gray looked out the window and said, Yes, it sure is a pity, isn't it? God bless their poor hearts. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. You know, when you're first saying, you pull over there, you pull over so far, you see, that's good, get separated. You pull over so far that there's no communion left. After a little while, you better see something. You better see, but only by the grace of God, that's you. It used to bother me, it don't bother me anymore. I've been to saunas and prayer pool, you know. I, I still go to the spa, you know, so I pump a little iron. And I mean a little, too, brother. Little. <laughs> at my age, you know, at my age, it's not bothered, but it's just care and maintenance. <laughs> and I was up there. I've been in that spa and seen some young guy there about 25 or 30. I have a blanket of like this and a blanket of like that and got the blanket of like that. I told a blanket of like sister, if you don't blanket of like this and blanket of like that and blanket of like this. I hear that stuff now. I just look at them and just grim. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, well, as I live and breathe, there is no Peter S. Ruckman. <laughs> That's just the way I talk for when I was saved. Help them out. Help them out. When was the last time you gave them any encouragement? I read the other day it took 60 percent of the Southern Baptist ministers in America, 60 percent, and they still got some fundamental men that still preach the truth. But 60% of them never lead more than 12 people to Christ in a lifetime. Over half the Southern Baptist ministers in America never lead more than 12 people to Christ in a lifetime. What a desperate thing. You know how many Southern Baptist members it takes to lead one soul to Christ? If you take the statistics they report with their church membership, it takes 900. 900 church members to get one person saved. That's a calamity. That's a calamity. Somebody isn't helping sinners out. Somebody isn't going out after them. Let me ask you this. If I gave you $20,000 for the soul you led to Christ, wouldn't some of you get real zealous? <laughs> you surely believe that a man's soul is more valuable than $20,000, don't you? But well, what's the problem? Suppose somebody pays you $20 an hour to win the souls. Would you still keep the job you got right now? See? See, the trouble is, you don't see it, you don't see the need for it, you don't see the burden for it. That's the problem. My little grandson, Gus, got saved the other day, and he really got saved. You know, I appreciate dedication by the school and let Jesus come into your heart and all this and that, but my way of dealing with the kids is just keep putting the word in them until I get the results I'm looking for. And you take little old Gus, he came to his mother the other day, he's about seven years old, and he said, Mama, he said, uh, Read me, tell it like it is. That's a kind of cartoon tract I gave him, gave all the family. Well, he knows it better than she knows it. He's, he's, he's been to it at least eight times. And she read it to him. Every now and then, he'd stop her and say, well, what does that mean? When she got all three, he said, all right, let's pray. <laughs> <laughs> and she started to pray, and, and he didn't pray. And she said, well, Gus, aren't you going to pray? He said, I want to make sure I get this right. And she said, all right, I'll show you how to pray and get it right. So she did. And he prayed and got saved. And he got saved. She went and told David about it. And, you know, David had been going to the vacation Bible school, memorizing scripture and all this stuff. That kid knew more scripture at four, and I knew at 26. And they were kind of, you know, shrugging their shoulders, you know. Kind of, you never know when it's real and when it's not, kid that age, you know. And about that time, the door opened and Gus came in. He was a real bright, peculiar character, you know. He looked at him and he said, what's wrong? <laughs> And David said, nothing. <laughs> and the ball went out. And they said they got to get the tables at the table, and David suddenly turned and just sat and noticed that, you know, Gus said, you look different or something. Your face looks different or something. And he put down his fork and said, well, I told you I got saved. <laughs> amen, brother. Amen. Amen. You ever see those rascals? We took them up to the car lackeys. And that's a big shouting place, you know. You bring, bring, bring wash when they're young, you know. We got them up there, people shouting around, jumping benches and everything, and... 
That night the back of the trailer and, and Gus says, Matthew, I'll preach and you need to sing it. So Gus is six and Matthew is three and Gus starts preaching and Matthew's running up down the trailer yelling, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. <laughs> and Gus gets up on the couch and he says, And if you don't repent, you'll go to hell. And if you get saved, you go to heaven. And you'll get rewards if you obey your mommy. <laughs> And Gus said, uh, and Matthew says, preach it, son. <laughs> now listen, you know those souls are precious. Uh, some of you folks, you know what your problem is? You're just not so conscious. That's it. I went in the house the other day. I was going out to do visitation with my young man. I had my visitation work, Brother Reed, fine fellow. Many times, listen, many times I've been out sitting around in homes down south talking to me about the Lord, talking about the soul, and had the Lord tell me just as distinctly say, get up and get back in that typewriter. I've had that happen many a time. The Lord tell me, there are people who can do this. You do what you can do. But I still knock on doors, still make visits, and the Lord is still giving me some souls. I was out the other day, Brother Lee went to the house there, and they had about four children, about a year apart. Oldest about, oh, about eight, I guess. And, oh, that big banging slam around the house. And Brother Reed got wisdom. I mean, he just learned how through the years doing personal work. So he babysits, you know. I sat on the couch and talked with a woman, and he got the kids off in the hallway and got playing something with them. Well, he messed things up. Talk to that woman. She's sour in churches, mad at churches. Couldn't come. She didn't have any clothes. Poor. on welfare. I got food stamps, this stuff, humiliated. They've been messed up in their married life, and when she was in the hospital, and giving birth to a legitimate child, some preacher came in there and told her she had no right to raise that child. She had to farm that child out, let somebody else adopt that child, because that child was born in sin, and this and that. I mean, well, the preacher didn't have a sink, so I'd give a brass monkey. And we got talking about this and that thing, and finally got around where she said she'd never seen how to be saved, took out a Bible, showed her how to be saved. And then she said, well, I'd like to be saved. I said, okay, let's do have a word of prayer. And she said, all right, but I'm not going to pray out loud. And I said, okay. So I just knelt ahead and prayed anyway. And I got through the prayer, and I said, now, if you'd like to be saved uh, and don't want to pray yourself, I'll, I'll show you how to pray. You can pray with me. She prayed and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save her. Asked the Lord to save her. Got born again. Real. Got up crying. Got a track on about her business. Folks say, oh, well, you can't waste time with poor folk like that, never mind to nothing anyway. I've troubled some of you folk. You just, you've been saved too long. You're just too big for your britches, some of you. You know what you need to do? You examine yourself. A little self-examination. Prove yourself. Whether you be in the faith. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer.